welcome everyone to the August installment of the IPM Hour. Today joining us is Dr. Kristen Bowers, who is a postdoctoral fellow at New Mexico State University. She has degrees in, well, she has a degree in economics from the University of Virginia and then graduate degrees from University of Florida in ecology and entomology. And she has a long history of working on biological control of weedy plants. And today she is going to talk about the bane of bicyclists in the West, puncture vine. Take it away, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Yes, puncture vine. Um, so this is a project that uh, we did last year and we're re, um, collecting some more data this year, I hope, about puncture vine weevils. So they um, were a biocontrol agent released in the early 1960s. Um, and there has been not um, tons of follow-up work and we're trying to figure out where they are and what they are up to out here. Uh, and so, as Matt said, I'm based at New Mexico State University. So um, anyway, with that, I'll just um, jump in with this research. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, share screen two. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna start just with a couple um, definitions or clarification of terms so that uh, we're all on the same page. And I suspect many of you are familiar with uh, classical biological control or what's sometimes called importation biocontrol, but just um, as um, Steve pointed out, if people find this uh, presentation later on YouTube or somewhere, then uh, it'll be there for people to see. So uh, again, this is a talk about puncture vine weevils and their overwintering biology. Um, but first I'm gonna talk about, you know, generally what is biological control? Um, I've seen a few different definitions, but the one I generally use is um, the use of uh, a living biological control agent or organism that has a positive uh, effect on people due to its negative effect on some other unwanted biological um, organism. And so basically the idea is the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, and so um, lots of people are familiar with things like uh, lace wings, which you see here, which are released uh, frequently in greenhouses to control aphids or other small plant feeding insects. So that's an example of what we call augment augmentative or augmentative biocontrol. And I'm going to touch on that briefly later, which is sort of why I mentioned it here. Um, and then conservation biocontrol. So that is an example of where you might improve the survival or effectiveness of an already existing biocontrol agent. So for example, here aureus is a really well-known predator of thrips and you might provide um, flowers, which are a pollen resource for aureus in an effort to increase your number of aureus. So those are other types of biological control. What I'm mostly talking about is classical uh, weed biological control. And so the idea here is that when we have uh, plants in their native range, they are fed on by a variety of herbivores. Uh, and when they go to a new place or they invade, you get the plant frequently without their natural enemies. Um, and so they tend to multiply and spread in a way that they do not spread in their home range. Uh, and so weed biological control is a type of classical biological control where we look for these host specific natural enemies in the native range and bring them to the new range uh, so that they will feed on their host plant uh, and reduce the coverage or spread of this uh, non-native plant. And so this type of uh, classical biological control is also used against insects. This is a citrus mealy bug and it's had a couple of uh, insects introduced against it, but I'm gonna be talking about weed biocontrol. So uh, this is in you know cases where we introduce insects from the native range of a plant to feed on uh, the plant in the introduced range. And so again, we're um, taking, so this is an example of alligator weed, which is a problem in the Southeast. So the weed uh, was introduced to the South we Southeast accidentally. Um, and this flea beetle was introduced from South America, which is the native range of alligator weed. And again, these are uh, natural enemies of the weed in the native range. Um, they cannot eradicate a pest. They can only reduce its density. So they're not gonna eliminate this thing, but um, they're introduced usually when all other methods of controlling a weed have failed. So in the case of water hyacinth, we get really good controls from weevils in a lot of cases, um, but we're never gonna get rid of water hyacinth. Um, 
And so again, the important part to note about biocontrol agents is they're host specific. So, I mean, Southern army worms, this little um, caterpillar you see here, it eats all kinds of things. So that would be a terrible biocontrol agent. So we look for insects that are host specific. Um, for example, the Brazilian pepper tree thrips um, feeds only on Brazilian pepper tree and one other tree that's closely related, but not native in the United States. Um, so anyway, that's my quick um, five minute introduction to biocontrol. So that's what we're talking about. Um, so there are, um, have been lots of weed biological control programs like what I just described. And um, a lot of them, almost 40% have been geographically variable, meaning the insects were, or arthropods were much more successful in some places than others. Um, and a lot of the failures or um, lack of control provided by those insects is thought to be because of temperature related reasons. So there was some kind of climate mismatch. Um, and so this is a really good, I think, um, pictorial um, uh, representation of what happens. This is from a paper by Nate Harms and colleagues. And so you see um, in boxes, um, in these two pictures, we have a climate mismatch. So the green circle shows you where the plant is and the orange circle is where the insect can survive. So it's sort of their climate envelopes. And so you see in the upper right hand corner, we have um, a plant and an insect that have incomplete overlap. Uh, and then down in C, we have a plant that has a much wider geographic than the insect. And so the, the plant can survive or tolerate much different climatic um, conditions than the insect. And so that's what happens sometimes when we have um, variable success in weed biocontrol. And so um, managing weeds that have a wide geographic distribution is really tricky because the arthropod or biocontrol agent doesn't survive in as many places as the weed can. Uh, and so I took these two photographs that you see um, to give you an example of uh, the one on the left is Colorado, where we have uh, puncture vine, the main topic of this talk. And then the one on the right is Las Cruces, where I'm based. And I took them both in December or January, I can't remember, but the same time of year. So, I mean, we have puncture vine in both these places. Um, but they have really different climatic um, conditions. And so that can really affect the performance of biocontrol agents. Uh, and until probably the early 21st century or late 20th century, not a lot of introductions involved climate matching or trying to figure out if the agent could climatically survive in the introduced range. Uh, and so most host range testing was just um, specificity testing and not, you know, any kind of climatic matching until relatively recently in, in biocontrol, weed biocontrol introductions anyway. And so puncture vine, most of us are probably familiar with puncture vine, unfortunately. Um, goathead is another common name. It's a summer annual plant um, and it grows in these big prostrate mats that can be a couple of meters in diameter. And it's got really pretty little yellow flowers. Um, and the name comes from the fruit or caltrop which has these five lobed and spiny segments. So each of these segments um, contains um, multiple seeds. And so this little, um, the photograph that you see on the right of one little um, goat head can have 15 seeds in it. And so you've probably seen that as the seeds mature, the segments will break apart and they become embedded in your shoes, your car tires, your bike tires, um, and animal fur and anything else they can stick to. Uh, I thought I'd show this picture because this is puncture vine maybe before you recognize it up at the, uh, on the upper left, this is what a newly um, uh, germinated seed looks like. And then on the right, this is where we commonly find it, at least in Southern New Mexico. It loves gravel parking lots and places where there's no other vegetation. And maybe also because it gets stuck to things and so it's easy to deposit it in a parking lot uh, or a field or someplace where there's a lot of um, foot and car traffic. Um, but we frequently find it, I frequently find it growing in these um, gravel lots, just covering the lot. Um, and so here in Southern New Mexico, we can see germination like this as early as March, especially where there's um, irrigation or supplemental water. So like at a baseball field or something where uh, the water also hits the parking lot, we, I see lots and lots of puncture vine. So uh, I thought this was a funny picture. It's, you know, one way people have taken to removing goat heads is just by pulling them out and 
uh, in Boise, they have what they call Goathead Fest, which is about this time every year. And last year, people picked nearly 12,000 pounds of goat heads in an effort to get rid of these things because they are so awful. Um, so despite our best efforts though, goat head is, um, it was introduced in the early 20th century and all of the counties that you see here in green have um, populations of goat head. It's found in almost every state, but it's much more um, of a nuisance as you can see west of the Mississippi River. And it is problematic in many places. It has a worldwide distribution. And so all of the countries that you see here in red are uh, places with puncture vine. But the origin of puncture vine is here in the Mediterranean. And so, uh, as I mentioned sort of briefly earlier, um, two biocontrol agents were introduced in the early 1960s from Italy. Um, I'm going to tell you about both of them, but this uh, the experiments that we did primarily are just deal with one of the agents. So this, uh, I'm going to talk about this one first, the stem, puncture vine stem weevil. Uh, and so the adults you see on the right, you see they're very cylindrical in form, so they sort of are stem shaped. Uh, the female will um, dig uh, or chew a little hole in the stem and lay her egg in the stem, and then the larva will develop, as you see on the left, in, it spends its whole life cycle in the stem, it feeds on the stem tissue inside, and then chews its way out as an adult. Um, and this is what the eggs look like. This is really cool. So what you see on the left is a picture of a stem. And uh, as I said, the female will chew her way into the stem. She will deposit a single egg in there, and then she'll cover it up with a little um, fecal cover. So this is... Um, this green area you see on the stem on the left, that is the cover. On, and if you take the cover off, you see the picture on the right, the kind of orangey, shiny um, globe, that is an egg. So that's what they look like. If you see in the field, you'll see the stems and you'll see these little dark green dots on the stems. That is a, a little fecal pack covering up her egg. So these are really um, tiny little insects. Uh, and we did not find a lot of stem weevils. And so we focused all these experiments primarily on seed weevils, which look really similar, um, but they're just a little bit, their abdomens are just a little bit wider. Um, and as you might guess from the name, the seed weevils feed and lay their eggs on the seed. So the, the female does the same thing. She digs a little or chews a little hole in the seed and she puts her egg in there and then the larva will uh, feed on the seed and the associated um, embryonic tissues. Um, and then chew its way out as an adult. Um, so they'll pupate inside the seed. Um, and I, I didn't mention earlier, the stem weevil takes a much, uh, almost twice as long to develop, close to 50 days. Um, and these little seed weevils take around a month. So they develop faster. And we found uh, last year in our surveys, a lot more seed weevils than stem weevils. Um, and so that's why uh, all the experiments that I'm going to describe today, we use seed weevils just because there's a lot more of them. And it was really, really hard to find stem weevils. They're there. They're just difficult to find. Uh, oh, and here's a picture. That's what the egg looks like. So those three little pits that you see there are um, where a female has laid eggs. And then they, we took off one of the little um, the fecal pads so you can see the egg kind of sticking out of the seed. So that's what those look like. So it's kind of cool. You can see them if you look. Um, but this is, I think, an unmagnified picture of the weevils on the plant. And you can see they're not easy to see. There's one, there's another one. So they're on there, but they're not easy to see. And so, um, you know, among biocontrol practitioners, there's been some anecdotal evidence of establishment failure. People have, you know, put out weevils and gone back the next year and been unable to find them. Um, and uh, states or places where they um, weevils are sold or given away to the public, they run out every year. There's more demand for weevils by homeowners and landowners than um, state agencies can provide. And so um, there's been a little bit of uncertainty about where exactly they are. People say they think they saw them or they saw them, but they couldn't find very many. And so um, there's not been a formal survey of um, weevil location since the release in the early 60s. Um, there's not a lot of records anyways. And, and so we decided to try to figure out what are these weevils doing 
Um, there's some suspicion that maybe they aren't cold tolerant enough for the northern northwest part of the United States. Um, I see lots of them here in southern New Mexico, lots and lots, but um, as we saw in the first picture, it's a lot warmer here. We don't get a lot of snow. Um, and so we are trying to figure out, are these weevils cold hardy enough for the north part of the western United States? Uh, and so this research project had three objectives. Um, the first was to figure out where there are weevils. Um, and so to survey um, the West and figure out what the current field distribution of both species of weevils was. Um, and so we thought that there would be weevil populations established, but smaller at higher latitudes um, based on the reports that we had from people in those places. We wanted to test what the thermal limits of weevils were from some different locations. And we suspected that weevils from northern latitudes would, would be able to tolerate colder temperatures maybe than southern latitude weevils. Um, and then finally, we wanted to compare the field overwintering ability of weevils from three different locations. And with the idea being that um, if, the, if there is a hardiness, then, you know, then southern weevils won't survive at, at uh, higher latitudes. But if there's no difference, you know, then that changes our management strategies and implications for how we can use weevils in different parts of the puncture vine range. So those were the three things that we set out to do with this project. Uh, so that's, I'm going to talk about this field survey first. Um, so we collected plants from around New Mexico and we measured them and we counted the seeds and the stems, like we measured the stems and then we quantified how attacked they were. Um, and if we found weevils and which weevils we found. And we also solicited um, some plants from our collaborators in other parts of the West to see what they had. Uh, and so these uh, are our survey locations. Um, like I said, we did all the surveys in New Mexico and then we had uh, collaborators send us data from, other, uh, from their states uh, when possible. And so, um, Oh, yeah, that I circled the places where we did not do surveys. All right, so I'm not going to talk too quantitatively about this, except to say we found weevils at all of the locations that we surveyed. Um, the green spots are where we found um, stem and seed weevils, so plants attacked by uh, both, sometimes the same plant, sometimes different plants. Um, you see, we had one site up in northern New Mexico where we found no attack, but other plants in that that same area were attacked. Um, one spot in around Sacramento, we only, our collaborators only found stem weevils. Um, and then we had a couple of anecdotal reports. So we didn't actually get a shipment, but uh, our collaborators went out and said, yep, we looked and there were weevils out there or signs of weevils. And so um, we counted those as having weevils. So there are weevils. Um, but the attack varied a lot, not necessarily geographically. In some places we had um, really low attack and some places um, almost every seed had a weevil in it, you know, 80% or more of the seeds were attacked. And in some places it was maybe 10 to 20%. And so there didn't seem to be actually a rhyme or reason, uh, but some places just had more weevils than others. Uh, but we did find weevils at all of the latitudes. So uh, for the next thing, we tested these um, weevils that we collected, um, and we collected them from three separate places. Um, one was around the Palisade Insectary uh, in Palisade, Colorado, near Grand Junction. So their average low in the winter is minus 8 degrees C. We collected a bunch from Farmington, New Mexico, which is a little bit warmer, and then uh, some in Las Cruces, which is warmer still. And so these were the three locations where we collected weevils. And also, as you'll see for the third um, objective, this is where we did our experiments as well. Um, so this is how we did this lower lethal project. We, um, we had the weevils at room temperature and then we slowly brought them down to the target temperatures. And that ranged from minus six to minus 10 because we thought that would encompass the, our, our coldest temperatures that we experience at these sites. And also that's the limit of this equipment actually. Um, and we followed a standard protocol, which was to hold them for two hours at the target temperature 
And then we would, um, so that's, you see this little contraption here, it brings them down to temperature, we held them, and then we would take them out and put them in a little recovery dish with some food and allow them to recover and feed for 24 hours. And then we would probe them to see if they responded or not. And so if they responded, they were alive, and if they did not respond, they were dead. So uh, this, so this is what we found. We have uh, weevils from three sources. Uh, we've got the Farmington weevils in green, the Las Cruces weevils in purple, and Palisade weevils in uh, the yellow. And so you see at this minus six, we had pretty good survival of all the weevils. Um, There's a lot of variation though. The Las Cruces weevils did a little bit worse. Um, I think we didn't end up doing minus seven. Minus eight, we had good survival. And then you see at minus nine, they really um, start to drop off. So I should have mentioned this is survival is on the y-axis. So uh, how many weevils survived uh, out after 24 hours? Um, so you see it really drops off between eight and nine. And then at minus 10, none of the Las Cruces, we had very low survival, really. Um, the Palisade weevils did a little bit better and Farmington was not much different than either one. Um, so there's some evidence there that maybe our palisade weevils are a little bit more cold hardy, just, but again, you know, this was at for two hours. So, you know, um, that's the sort of the lower lethal limit. Um, and then the last thing we did was we compared the uh, field overwintering ability. So, I mean, that's really the most important part, right, is what are they going to do in the field? It doesn't really matter what they do in the lab. If they are uh, not surviving in the field, then you're not going to have a very good uh, population for next year. So, again, these were the sites where we had collected weevils, and so these are the same sites where we uh, established overwintering cages. Uh, and so we collected all the weevils in September from these sites. And so we, um, our method was to get these big um, yard trash bags that you see on the left and fill them full of um, puncture vine infested material from the locations. And then we would bring them back to the lab and um, aspirate the weevils out. And then we put uh, the weevils in little groups of 10 into these little cups with some food. Uh, and, and until we were ready to put them in cages, which was pretty much immediately. Um, we grew all the plants from seeds in Las Cruces, so all the plants were the same. Uh, and then we placed plants in these individual bags that you see in the photograph on the right. Uh, we put 10 weevils on each plant, and then we sewed these little uh, lumite bags shut. And so each bag had a unique number and it had uh, the location and the date that we would remove them from the field and inspect them. And so then we took them out to the field at the three locations in Palisade, Farmington, and in Las Cruces. And we put them in these big walk-in cages. So each of these walk-in cages has 21 of these uh, little potted plants with 10 weevils each on them. And, um, each location had five of these big walk-in cages. And so um, here's a schematic to sort of help you understand what we did. So each of the boxes, the big boxes represents a cage. So there's five of those. And then we had one, um, one plant per month per location in each cage. So we have the seven months, the seven sampling months and the three weevil sources. So every month, so for example, we set the cages up in September. In October, we would go through and pull out all of the October marked cages and there would be an October um, cage with Palisade weevils, an October cage with, uh, with um, Farmington weevils and an October cage with Las Cruces weevils in each of the big walk-in cages. So that gave us uh, 45 plants per month over the three um, sites. And so the first question was really, are we going to be able to find these weevils, right, in these cages? So every month we would, we would um, remove a single um, potted plant, these little tiny cages, and bring them into the lab and see how many uh, weevils we could find. So um, across the course of the study, it varied between 70 and 80 percent, but there wasn't a big difference in the number of weevils we found per cage per month. So um, whether they were alive or dead, we still managed to find more than 70% of the weevils uh, every month. 
So uh, let's get into survival though. Oh, first let's talk about temperature. So this is, we had temperature loggers um, outside of all the cages and also inside the small cages. Um, and so these are the monthly, this is the maximum temperature um, Celsius on the y-axis and there's our three locations. So you see Farmington and Palisade aren't all that different. Las Cruces was warmer uh, by a fair bit there. Um, and then in the individual cages, so this is um, temperature loggers that are protected from direct sun by both the big walk-in cage and by the, these were in the individual potted plants. So you can see it really uh, moderated the, the warm temperatures uh, uh, throughout the season. But again, Farmington and Palisade are pretty similar. Um, Las Cruces was warmer, not terribly surprising. Um, all right, so this is what we're really interested in though, is minimum temperatures. Uh, and again, the, um, the cages kept the pots a little bit warmer than they were. It was colder outside. You see, we got down to minus 20 in Farmington uh, in February, uh, but not quite that cold. Uh, the temperatures that the insects would have been experiencing are the individual cage temperatures. So you can see it's, it's a fair bit warmer and it got right down to 10, but not really below that uh, in Palisade and Farmington. Um, so that's just, uh, in case you were wondering how the cages affected the temperature, it definitely modulated the temperatures, both warmer and cooler. Um, and, and Farmington and Palisade were pretty similar and, and Las Cruces was warmer, both for uh, minimum and maximum. All right, so, hang on. All right, so uh, what was the effect of weevil source on survival? This was our main question, right? And so you can see, um, so let's see, uh, just as a note, this is the mean probability of death. So we modeled death instead of alive, so that should, um, so obviously the more, the higher the number, the worse they did, right? So the probability of them dying is, uh, is what we modeled on the Y and then dates the months on the X axis. And so we have F, so the red line is the Farmington source, the green line is Las Cruces and the P is Palisade. And so you see they start off um, very low probability of death after a month. We recovered almost all of the weevils alive initially. And then you see we have a big drop off in November, right? So we've got, um, but still not a huge difference between Farmington and Palisade and Farmington and Las Cruces. Um, so the general pattern is all the same. You see there, um, we find fewer and fewer live weevils as the experiment goes on. And by April, which was the last month, we had no, or well, March, we had no live weevils. Um, so you see, for example, in December, it looks like the Palisade weevils are doing a little bit better, but then by January, we've got really, really low survival for all of the sources. So there does seem to be some effect of source sort of initially, but then um, over time it disappears. Um, this is a similar question, but a little bit different. Is the probability of weevil death lower in a warmer location? So this is looking at the sources altogether, um, but again, the probability of death here on the y-axis and, but this is location. So instead of doing source, this is where the, the weevils spent their winter. So, but again, Farmington in red, Las Cruces in green and Palisade in blue. And so you see there's some interaction here because we've got a crossing of the line. So um, initially the Palisade, the weevils at Palisade did very well and the, the weevils at Las Cruces did the worst initially. Uh, but then you see as time goes on, the weevils that were overwintered in Las Cruces, which is the warmest location, did a little bit better through the winter. Uh, but then by the time we get to the spring in March and April, again, we find we're, we're still finding 70 to 80 percent of the weevils we put in those cages, but none of them are alive by March or April. Um, so kind of a um, confounding result there. Um, again, maybe, but maybe not super surprising, the weevils that had the mildest winter survived the longest, um, but did not survive until April, which is, you know, March or April is the earliest you could expect to see puncture vine here. Um, this one is a little bit complicated, but really um, kind of digs into um, what we're seeing. So I looked at here, how did the source of the weevils and where they spent the winter, their cage location, 
influence the probability of their death. Um, and you see there's, again, as I mentioned before, there's an interaction of factors. So time, cage location, and weevil source are interacting. So mortality probability is initially, again, higher at Las Cruces, but then increases more quickly at Palisade and Farmington. Um, but the weevil response across time is similar, um, as you can see from the similar shape of the curves. So, um, and again, the panels represent the source here. So this is all the weevils from Farmington, um, and this is the lines represent location. So this is Las Cruces weevils, um, and where the line is the overwintering cage. So again, a very similar pattern there. Um, and this is the same graph, but with the source and location flipped. So here we have, um, this is the, the site of the overwintering cage and the source of the weevils now are these lines. So again, we see some differences. I mean, the most obvious one is the Palisade weevils here in blue did a little bit better than the other weevils at the warmer site uh, until the end. So again, it's not a uh, very straightforward um, answer. You know, there was some interaction between cage and locate or uh, cage location and weevil source, um, but you see the same general pattern. So source is was not the biggest source of uh, variation in this experiment. But the take home, I mean, if we go back a second, none of the weevils survived in April or March or April, which is, as I said down here, the earliest you could probably expect to see puncture vine uh, consistently would be probably March. Um, and so why aren't they surviving outside? Uh, we came up with a couple of different explanations, which I will talk about. Um, the first is maybe they really aren't very cold hardy. Um, and that's sort of our, our original hypothesis is maybe these weevils just don't really do well in cold weather. Um, the other could be uh, their overwintering location. And by this, I mean the literature reports that these weevils uh, overwinter in the leaf litter. And so that's what we assumed when we set up these cages, but we hadn't actually tested that. And we thought, what if they actually overwinter in the seeds and stems? And that's how they remain protected from cold. And so by putting in plants that had um, not been attacked before we put them in the cage, maybe, you know, that's, that's why we didn't see them overwintering because they don't actually overwinter in the leaf litter. And so I'm gonna get to that in just a sec. Um, one thought was maybe our weevils were old. Uh, we collected them late, in, well, early September, but late in the season. And so, um, but it's a possibility. And the other thing, um, the other explanation is that they need micro habitats, that they're sort of, that they aren't very cold hardy. And the ones that survive until the next year have just found more protected places um, to spend the winter. And so um, that's why the populations start out so low is because they really need a protected micro habitat to survive uh, in the winter. And so I'm going to address um, all of these in just a second. Um, so yeah, it's possible that there are no latitudinal differences in cold hardiness. Um, and you know, we sort of got at that a little bit here. Um, but again, this overwintering experiment, I only collected weevils from as far north as Palisade and as far south as Las Cruces to test this. And there's a whole swath of uh, Western states that I did not collect from last year. Um, and maybe there is some cold hardiness up there. Uh, and so that is an open question. I'm actually planning to collect some in uh, Idaho and Montana in the next couple of weeks to see what we see. Um, this is, it should be a good time of year for that. Um, so that's one possibility is that Palisade and Las Cruces just aren't different enough to see an adaptation to cold. Um, the next question was, is it possible that they don't overwinter in the leaf litter? Like no one had ever confirmed it. Um, as I said, these are reports from pretty old literature and so it's possible maybe that's not what they're really doing. And so we tried to figure that out. Um, and so what we did was we went to these spots uh, where we had collected uh, puncture vine weevils uh, at last fall and we found the dead vines and plants. 
and we took a shot back uh, and we um, laid out a quadrat and we sucked up all of the sand and leaf litter that we could from those quadrats um, with the shot back that you see here. And then we dug up the plants, what was left of the plants, like the stems and whatnot, and we poked through them in the lab. And so we dissected the stems and we dissected the seeds and we um, dumped all of the stuff that we had sucked out of the vacuum into a bucket and sorted through it to see what we could find. Um, and so um, what you see here is the weevils we found in seeds and stems. So we did this primarily in Las Cruces just as a sort of a proof of concept here. Um, and also because there's lots of snow on the ground in the winter in those other places and it was real hard to find old plants. But we did not find any live stem or seed weevils in stems or seeds in Las Cruces in November, in December, in January, in February, or March. So I'm pretty sure they're not overwintering there. Um, like I said, we did this for quite a number of plants every month, and we did not find a single. We found a few um, dead pupae or adults that did not emerge from seeds or stems, but we did not find, um, there was no evidence that they had uh, that they were spending the winter there. Uh, and so that's what you see here. What we did find though, was when we um, went through the leaf litter, we found live adults in November, December, January, and February in Las Cruces in the leaf litter. Um, we looked but did not find uh, live, we did find adults in Farmington and Palisade, but nothing alive in those places. So um, this tells me a couple things. So they are overwintering in the leaf litter um, and we found them alive up until February, which is about when we found them alive in the cages as well. Um, the fact that we didn't find any alive in Farmington or Palisade, well, you know, it, as I said, we had a fair bit of snow last year. And so um, whether or not they were alive earlier, I don't know. Um, but yeah, we, so I don't, they are overwintering in the leaf litter as much as they are surviving. They're not in the stems or seeds over the winter. Um, and so I think it is an open question about whether or not there is some more cold hardiness in populations that we haven't looked at. Um, I, oh, the overwintering location, I'm satisfied that they are in the leaf litter. Um, again, the old weevil question is possible. Um, I'm not sure how much later we could collect weevils to test that just because, you know, if you get a cold snap and miss the weevils, then you've sort of missed it for the year. Um, I do think microhabitats might be an important explanation, um, just that the weevils in some spots where there's puncture vine, the, the weevils are protected. You know, they're on the south side of a building or up near something else that doesn't get as cold and they do a little bit better. Uh, or if they're in really big puncture vine mats that sort of insulate them. And, and possibly even the snow, maybe it's a little bit warmer on the ground surface when there is snow on the ground and that's how they're surviving at real low levels uh, over the winter, but they don't, they don't appear to have great survival anywhere in, in any part of the range, honestly, from what we've seen. Uh, and so where does that leave us for this year? Well, um, my first um, project is to collect and test weevils from um, Wyoming, Montana, maybe Nevada and Washington, depending on what I can find. Um, so I think that'll be an important clue to see if we have weevils that are more cold tolerant anywhere else in the Western US. Um, I plan to repeat the field overwintering trial, as I mentioned um, at the very beginning before we sort of started, I'm watering where my puncture vine was last year to try to get vines to come up. And uh, there are weevils around, but we don't have a lot of puncture vine. It's been really dry this year. Um, and then, you know, the, the, we could get into the physiological and genetic differences of weevils um, since we have a, a few different populations that we could test. You know, insects have different physiological responses to cold. And so, you know, whether we can find some different markers of uh, cold tolerance in different populations might, might give us some evidence about whether there are, really are any differences in what their cold um, overwintering strategy is.
Um, and so, you know, sort of, I still think it's a little bit of an open question, you know, if microhabitats are important, then protecting existing overwintering sites might help. Um, you know, I mentioned importation, I mentioned augmentative biocontrol at the top because, you know, it may be a situation where they are not cold hardy enough to um, really overwinter in any sort of meaningful number. And so aug augmentative biocontrol might be the way to go that you know, you take weevils that, you know, here we have weevils as early as May and you put them on, you know, every bit of puncture vine you can find because you won't see puncture vine weevils farther north because they're just, they haven't emerged yet or there's no puncture vine. So you just, as soon as you see puncture vine, you augment them with weevils that you already have from Southern locations, right? It's an augmentative rather than a, a true classical biocontrol strategy. Um, so that's one idea, um, you know, whether or not that's cost efficient, that's hard to say. Um, and then, you know, the last strategy that's been used for some other things is, you know, if we can say, nope, they are not cold tolerant at all, is maybe to find more co cold tolerant biotypes. Uh, you know, it's something that um, is, seems worthwhile for other biocontrol agents and whether or not it is for um, seed weevil is, uh, is it, I think, a uh, question worth asking at any rate. So, I mean, depending on what we find with more Northern populations, I think any one of those three strategies might um, improve the um, performance of puncture vine weevils and reduce the seed load that we see, you know, year in and year out. I think the seeds can survive about five years, um, but these, these insects only attack green seeds. So um, once the seed is overwintered, it's not, um, it's not going to be re-attacked by a puncture vine weevil. Um, so uh, again, I'd like to thank um, Western IPM Center for funding this project and inviting me to give um, a talk about it today. And I would be happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone has. Great, thanks, Kristen. That was uh, that was thank pretty you. neat. Yeah, um, it's been a really fun project to work on. I wish I had um, some whiz bang answer. <laughs> Uh, so, very well. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, so if uh, folks have questions, what you can do is you can either take your mic off mute or you can type your question into the chat. We do already have one question in the chat from Paul Pratt here in California. Um, and he's asking, do cold hardy, cold hardy biotypes exist in the native range? and what is known about the herbivores range in cold climates of Europe? What is known? Um, well, my recollection from the literature is that they, the weevils are from Northern Italy and I do not remember whether mm, more efforts were made to find cold tolerant um, yeah, I don't remember the importation history and whether they imported multiple times from more cold locations, um, but they do have a really, I think, pretty wide distribution. So, um, yeah, I guess it's worth going to look at the old literature and seeing if that's even a possibility. I thought, um, I have not done that. I don't know. Yeah, it might be that there, there isn't, right, that they, these only exist around you know, closer to the Mediterranean where it's, they have mild winters and that's the reason why puncture vine is so, you know, ubiquitous is because the weevils really only can survive around the Mediterranean. That's totally possible. Does that system exist? Because I know the northern region of Italy is pretty mountainous as you climb up into the Alps. So yes. I guess the question would be, does puncture vine climb up into the Alps and do the weevils follow them there? I would love to go to the Alps and find out, but I do not know. <laughs> okay. Hey, Chris. Um, Chris, yes, this, go ahead. Is, this is Paul again. And I'm just Hi, following up that I don't remember the importation history either. So um I yeah, I was just wondering, and would it be of interest to have individuals collected from more northern ranges to include in your survivor your your cold hardy bioassays? Um, because I think you could do that without too, too much difficulty, assuming that you could keep them in, in quarantine and look at them under ah. conditions. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, so my, um, I'm hoping to go to um, Montana this in a couple of weeks and see what I can find. But yes, I, we could, I do have a quarantine that we could use to see. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to say that um, the records aren't clear because it's been a while since I actually looked at all those papers to see, but I feel like they maybe weren't as specific as some more modern papers are about where the weevils actually came from. And I don't, I don't know if that's in the gray literature somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. I am not seeing any other questions currently. Uh, so I have one. Uh, mm -hmm. How much do these things move around? Like, do they, are the populations relatively isolated or do they tend to fly around quite a bit and, and move, you know, north to south or east to west? My suspicion is probably that we move them um again because this they're so good at sticking to things is that we maybe in because i really um i don't again i don't know if there's records of them being released in new mexico but we found them at all the sites and some of these places are I don't know how many people have been to New Mexico, especially Eastern New Mexico, but there are some very isolated spots there. And so I don't think, even though, you know, they, um, they don't really tend to fly that much. They do like light, you know? And so when I had those big bags of puncture vine and we were trying to get weevils out of them, if there was a hole in the bag, you'd come in and the whole office the window in the office would be covered with weevils, right? And so yeah. they do move, but you know, you, they wouldn't, if you open the bag, they don't all fly out. And so, um, like I said, we found them in some real isolated places in New Mexico where I was really surprised because I am sure no one dumped weevils out there, but they moved. And so I think just people, they, they get moved in the stems and seeds and there you go. Yeah, yeah. So these yeah, I don't think they're- very probably be genetically isolated populations then i would kind of think but yes i actually have a colleague here um in the biology department who's interested in this question among others and so we're talking about that's sort of why i threw that slide in there because we were talking about she looks at um cold tolerance of um native bees and so we were talking about all the ways we could look at you know genetic and protein expressions and figure out like how, you know, or even like you said, are these populations different? How related are they? And what's sort of the, been the connectedness or gene flow among them? Because like I said, there are places where like, you wouldn't even know it was there really, except all of a sudden you're like, oh, look, there's puncture vine, we should stop. And lo and behold, there's beetles in there. Yeah. Oh, we started driving around to um, lots of little towns in New Mexico have rodeo arenas, like 4-H mm -hmm. kind of things. And they're like, like I said, these places that there's not even a, a stoplight or anything, and there's functional weevils there, which was really a surprise to me. Well, what would be interesting to know is if they are in fact isolated, and you in essence would have, um, you know, uh, almost like iso lines uh, mm -hmm. in these various populations that were reproductively isolated. You know, you could like pull some of these together and actually see if you get heterosis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if that would work. You know, like hybrid vigor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so we talked about that and I I uh, ran out of weevils and room before I figured all that part out. So we'll, we'll see what we do this year. Okay, so uh, again, if folks have questions, we still have a little time. So um, by all means, uh, either put your uh, question in the chat or Take your mic off mute. I have another question. It's somewhat unrelated to the topic, but it is kind of related to the topic, but I'll mm -hmm. hold that question until give other folks a chance. Okay. But now I'm curious. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll ask my, so I have often wondered about the impact of stem weevils on plants because the inside of the stem is basically just pith, which I suppose has some structural, you know, reason for being there. But beyond that, like they don't seem to feed on anything but the pith. 
Like, what impact do they really have? How do they impact the plant's health? Well, you know, so it makes this, so you can tell if there's a stem weevil without even really looking for the holes because they just, the stems just break off. Yeah. So I actually think the stem weevil is really, I mean, in terms of like keeping a mat small, you know, so it can't get to be two meters wide. You know, I think the stem weevils are really good. Um, yeah, because then the stem just breaks off and that part of the plant dies, right? So all the developing seeds die, the plant doesn't, I think, I guess it shoots out new stems, new, you know, but um, they take a long, you know, this is something when I was looking through these old papers, the stem weevils take like 50 days to develop. And I wonder, so that was another thing, I didn't really talk about this, but you know, the uh, anecdotal evidence or maybe some of the spec more speculative parts of the literature that I've read say, well, we think the stem weevils are even less cold tolerant because there's so few of them. But I think it's just because they take longer to develop, right? If they take 50 days and I was talking to somebody else about this and they were saying like, yeah, here, you know, and there's plenty of places where, um, you know, depending on the rain, you might not have puncture vine until August and then you get a freeze in September, that's not 50 days, you know, or you're never gonna get more than, like I was talking to the folks at Palisade and Sectory who are collaborators on this project. And, and they said, they think, although they've never actually done it, they think that the um, weevils are all univolting there and mm -hmm. they are not here, right? And so I think that's part of the difficulty with population buildup is they just don't have enough days to, even if they got, you know, 57 days, then you get one and almost a second generation and then all the pupae die, right? And so I think that is it. So so that sort of goes back to why I think maybe augmentative biocontrol isn't a terrible idea for these, right? Because they can survive, yep. um, but they just don't have long enough to develop enough, you know, they don't get into exponential population growth the way we do here because we've had them since May you know, or April, maybe I didn't even think to look then, but you have puncture vine, you, like I said, as long as there's water, you know, you start seeing puncture vine and where there's puncture vine, I mean, every little spot I look at is attacked around here. And so their weevils are around. Um, and so I think an augmentative strategy to try to lower your, um, your seed bank is not a terrible idea, although, you know, they still puncture your bike tires even if the seeds aren't viable, which is annoying. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, but you know, just in terms of reducing your population pressure, your propagule pressure for the next year, you know, like if you've got the, you know, you can get, the seeds can be attacked by multiple weevils, right? And they don't kill all the seeds, but they, they do hammer the seeds. It's just, there just aren't enough of them. And I think it's more driven by voltanism, which is, I mean, obviously that's related to temperature, but it's not true. There's not a true difference in, in cold tolerance, maybe as much as just, right. we've got more heat days here. And so you get more generations and exponential population growth versus, you know, one and done generations. And, you know, it's just hard to build up a lot of insects, which is what you need. Yep. Makes right? sense. Right. When you've got 10,000 seeds or some, whatever crazy number of seeds they make. Well, but they're, they're legumes, right? So they don't tend to produce like a ton of seeds per plant, right? No, they're in the same. Aren't they, think, oh, they're not legume? Uh-uh. No, they're in the same plant family as creosote. Oh. Zygote or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, they're not. It's not a legume. Um, no, but there are those, each of those little goat heads has, if you, you know, there's five little ovaries in there and each ovary has two to three seeds. So like each one of those stupid goat heads could have 15 individual seeds in it. And so, yeah, <laughs> right? So, I mean, the weevils, they, <laughs> they don't eat, you know, just in one ovary. They will, you can see if you open them up, sometimes they attack two or three ovaries and sometimes there's two weevils in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, unfortunately the spine is still there, but at least you could reduce your, your you know, next year's population of, of little plantlets. But yeah, yep, jerks. <laughs> you won't get any argument from me there. No, I know. I know we're going through like sealant by the gallon in my house, so. Right, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, 
So. Oh yeah, I think I threw my email up there too. So if anyone. Oh great. So if anybody has any follow up questions, by all means, send Kristen an email. Um, I'm still, thank, you know, pursuing all kinds of of Quantrivine questions. So. Yeah. Well, uh, more power to you. We, <laughs> we are we're really hoping that you've solved this problem so that the rest of us can stop buying inner tubes and tires. Yeah. No, and my students are tired of that too. <laughs> like, can we work on something that doesn't have spines or thorns? Not yeah. a chance, right? Every plant in the desert has spines and thorns. Yep. Uh, so thanks again, Kristen. That Thank was uh, great. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone that we have uh, the next IPM hour for September is coming up on the 13th and following along in this uh, biological control, in this case, conservation biological control theme. Uh, that's going to be Beth uh, Pringle, who's in Nevada, and she's going to be talking about conservation bio biological control in Nevada alfalfa. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Steve, am I forgetting anything? No. Thanks, Kristen. Appreciate it. Thank you.